Turn with me in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 4 if you'd like to follow along. So continue, uh, finish up our study in the book of Ruth. Uh, It's been a fun uh, study. Uh, I think there's a lot still here. You could go mine back through and mine out, Um, but we've hit uh, some of the major themes that we moved across. As we... uh, I started this series uh, talking about romantic comedies because, in a, in a way, there is an element of romance that, that filters through the book of Ruth. We think about those uh, Hallmark uh, romance movies. There's a whole channel now dedicated to that. Uh, at Christmas time, they play them, you know, every day up leading up to Christmas in December. A new one each day, and it's really turned into really an industry of romance. But they're all basically the same scenario, aren't they? They got, it's usually a baker or a writer, some reason, I don't know why that's a, a huge, huge industry, but, uh, and they're gonna lose the bakery or they're gonna lose uh, the old inn that's been in the family forever and there's this push and pull between the two characters and they uh, eventually fall in love and get married and resolve whatever issue is at the end. But a lot of it's based, if you think about it, a lot of it's based, and there's nothing wrong with those, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining about them. Um, They're actually sometimes better wholesome TV than a lot of the other stuff that's on. But the basic premise is at the end, it's really emotionally driven. That the love is, there's an emptiness in their lives and they're just, they're going through life and really it's kind of a meaningless existence, but if they get love in their life and they get this love interest in their life, then their life is fulfilled. And this whole idea of this emotional journey is really not a godly-based type of love. Romance and the emotional aspect of love is a a good thing, and God gives us our emotions for a reason. But love, a godly love, is so much deeper than that. And in our story uh, with Ruth and Boaz, as we get to this point, I think we're going to see some beautiful examples of godly love in action and things that we can really put into our lives, I believe. Now I say, at this point, we say, we get to chapter four, we see that Boaz is in love. Now let me read uh, the end of chapter three. I think it, uh, uh, Naomi and Ruth are talking. Uh, Ruth has this interaction with Boaz in the threshing uh, room floor, and she sent, he sends her away with a big gift of barley, and, and she comes back. In verse 16, it says, when she came Ruth to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me, uh, for he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn the matter, how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. And Boaz, if you think about it, Ruth's story, backstory, Ruth and Naomi come from Moab, Uh, Naomi and her family and her sons have gone to Moab to escape famine. They get to Moab to spend about a decade there. In the meantime, Ruth marries one of Naomi's sons. Both Naomi's husband and her two sons pass away. And Ruth stays with Naomi, loves that relationship with God and with Naomi, and comes back uh, after about a decade, comes back to Bethlehem. And she's out working in the field and Boaz shows up in the afternoon and she'd been working out in the common fields all day and worked her way over at that time towards Boaz's field. And you can imagine how the play goes. It goes back and forth as Boaz talks to his, uh, his probably his property manager and says, hey, who's that woman out there? And the property manager, uh, what woman? He's like, ah, uh, that woman out there. And he's like, which woman? That, the one out there? You mean, oh, you mean Ruth. And he knew who Ruth was. And I think at, at that moment, because he, he says, oh, that's Ruth, and he talks about her character. And so you see that, uh, I think, in a, in a fun way, that property manager probably pushing them back and forth. You can imagine what guys do. Oh, you mean that woman over there? Are you interested in that woman? No, 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 just not a big deal. But you see this kind of this romance kind of expand as it goes back and forth. But you see it's based on character rather than emotion. Both Boaz was a man of substance, a wealthy man, probably of means, but it really means moral character more than it does uh, money in that sense. So as we get to chapter 4, Naomi says, look, he's not going to settle. So it's the morning time, the day is sprung, and off goes Boaz 
to settle the matter. And let's see how it goes. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. Now, understand back in this time, you went to matter, settle matters publicly. You didn't go to courts. You went to the gate. And elder, the elders of the town would hang out there, all the kind of, you want to call them politicians, not really politicians, but they would hang out at the gate. All your elders, the wise men would be. And you, when you wanted to transact, transact business, that was kind of the meeting place. Uh, they would meet in the morning, uh, and you would do business back and forth, and you would take care of issues that might arise within the community. You'd come there to get maybe the local gossip. It would be a place that a lot of people would hang out, coming and going in a constant uh, matter. And so as you see the gate, that's, that's why he's there at the gate. He wants to take care of this matter in a public way. And the Redeemer of whom Boaz has spoken came by, so Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men uh, of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling a parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz says, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to per per titu uh, perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So then the Redeemer, the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was a custom in the former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one uh, drew off a sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off a sandal. Then Boaz says to the elders of all the people, you are witnesses this day I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Limelech and all that belonged to Chilon and Methelon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Methelon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate uh, and the elders said, We are witnesses, may the Lord make uh, the woman who is coming into your house, like Rachel and Leah, together and build up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathath, and be known in Bethlehem, and may your house be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because the offspring of the Lord will give you by this young woman. This morning we're going to see that God's love can change the very core of the way we live, if we allow it to. We see in Boaz, I think, the example of, of Jesus, and can use these uh, particulars of God's love in our life. There's things that we can learn from this story, these four chapters, and this chapter in particular, the things that impact us, I think, can impact us in a real way. When I was first dating Debbie, um, she had a, uh, she starts smirking right away because she knows I'm up to something. She, um, what was interesting to me, she had this relationship with a, a lady called Vi. And um, she, how old was she, Debbie, when... 83. And it was interesting to me because uh, Debbie's just a, a young woman and she got this relationship with, with Vi and she would go and do things with Vi. She would go and take her out to lunch and they, I think you shared knitting things and different things and really just had this cool relationship. See, Vi's husband a few years earlier had passed away. He had, uh, they lived in Pontiac. Uh, just wouldn't move out of a bad part of town, and some people tried to rob the house in the middle of the night, beat him up, and he ended up passing away from his injuries. And so Debbie, I don't know how they connected, took her under her wing, kind of so to speak, or had this relationship where she kind of took her around. She didn't really have family that was close that really interacted with her. But Debbie would take her own personal time to do this and do this relationship. I had gone with her a couple times to take by here, there, or wherever. And that, that relationship impacted me as we were dating because it really told me 
that she had this sacrificial type of love towards Vi. It was really, think about it, a 21-year-old, what a whole lot of, you know, interest in somebody that's not a family member, but yet took her and treated her like a family member. That affected me in a, in a powerful way because I, I thought there's some depth to this young lady, this, this girl that I'm dating. See, because really God's love is a, is a sacrificial love. True love, and Ron and Ruthie could probably attest to this, doing 63 years, still cracks me up. You don't sit right next to her. And so, uh, well. But there's sacrifices in, in a marriage relationship that happens, right? Good marriages, there's, there's a push and pull between the, the two parties. And that's, that's really a, a neat thing to see. As we look at the first 10 verses here, let's talk about Boaz. Naomi picked up that Boaz, he's going to settle this matter today. And Boaz goes right to the gate, and he sets this thing up. He gets 10 elders there. And if you notice, by the language, there's, there's more people kind of gathered around because <clears throat> they want to see what's going to go on. And Boaz makes a bold move, kind of his big move, I think. And you see... And he brings the, the redeemer comes and he says, hey, here, pull aside, my friend. Let's, let's sit down and let's talk. I want to let you know that uh, Naomi has a piece of land that she needs to sell. And you're the nearest redeemer. You're nearer than I am. And so would you like to redeem this land? And so this guy is doing some calculations, understand this part of it. It's, uh, he's doing calculations, this redeemer. So now remember, as we talked last week, that as a redeemer, you don't have to redeem things. It's, it's a, it's, it, there's really no obligation to it. And so he's thinking in his mind, he's, he's thinking, well, Naomi's older. She's not going to have any more kids. And so if I redeem this land, if I pay for it, it'll eventually become part of my inheritance that I can pass on. So that would be a good investment for me. And so he's, that's kind of his motivation there. And so he says, yeah, I can do it. And then Boaz hits him with a master stroke here. See, he, he drops the hammer. He says, hey, okay, so that's great. You're going to take that. So just remember, with the land comes Ruth. You need to marry Ruth and take care of Ruth. And he's like, oh, well, oh, wait a minute. I didn't know that was part of the deal. Because he's thinking, because now, now remember this part of it, and this is why I think, think Boaz played it like this, because there was not not an obligation on his part to have to marry Ruth for the Redeemer, but he would be responsible to take care of her. So there's a, we noticed last week that, that Ruth had the option to choose one way or the other, and so did the Redeemer have a way to choose one way or the other. But if he chose to uh, marry Ruth, he would be, uh, if they had children, that that male child, that land would inherit back to him. So he'd be responsible for taking care of another family member. He'd be responsible for redeeming the land, and he would not, at the end of the day, wouldn't be part of his inheritance, and then his inheritance would be kind of, could be messed up. And so he's like, well, wait a minute, that's not going to work out for me because it would be a huge expense for him to outlay with really no benefit. And that's what Boaz does here. And that's why I say, you know, you can see that Boaz is in love with Ruth, that, that, that this, this love is a, is a deep one. He says that it's a, there's a huge financial burden to do this. See, as we look at redemption, redemption comes at a cost. The Redeemer had to be related. He had to be able to help. He had to be willing to sacrifice. It was a great cost, financial cost, in some cases, uh, more than that, emotional and other things. He had to be willing to do that, and he was under really no obligation to help. It was a redeemer's choice. And I think I look at that list, and I think just what, what Jesus did for us. Jesus is able to help us. We are in a position that we cannot help ourselves. Ruth is in a position where she can't solve this problem. And we're kind of in the same position. We need a redeemer to cover our sins. And we see that Jesus marks all these boxes. He is able to help. He was willing to sacrifice everything for us, but he was under no obligation to have to do that. I think we get in this, we, we tend to get in this mode where it's almost like, and I've heard people talk about, well, if God is love, he'll just take care of me. Like, like God has obligations to us. He has no obligations to us. 
we have responsibilities and obligations to God, but he has none towards us. And that makes the gift of grace, the love that he shows, so much greater when you understand that. He did it because he loved us. We were rejecting him, rebelling against him, and he still gave the most precious thing he had. He was willing to help. See, ultimately, this is an act of love to reach out and do this thing. Boaz loves Ruth and is willing to sacrifice for her. True love is a willingness to sacrifice for others, even if they don't deserve it. That's what true love is. It's this, the godly love is one that, that cares about people even though sometimes they don't deserve it. See, Jesus sacrificed for each of us, and I'm going to turn to Hebrews chapter 7, if you'd like to follow along. In Hebrews uh, chapter 7, description of Christ is here. It says, verse 26, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those, in, uh, those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then the, for those the sins of the people, since he did not. He did this once for all when he offered up himself. Christ is perfect lamb. The scripture of him is a holy and perfect. He offered himself up once for all of us. He doesn't have to do it on a continual basis, but he paid the ultimate price and showed it. In Romans 12.1, we've hit upon this verse uh, other times. It's a, it's a great verse. In Romans 12, 1, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, my brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We're to be living sacrifices. Showing God's love to those around us is one that's a sacrificial type of love. It doesn't mean you get run over and let people walk over you, but it's one that's willing to put their needs ahead of your own. It's, a, it's willing to be Christ-like in how we go about our love because it, it changes other people's lives. And I love this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. He says, throwing that, Paul's throwing that in there in Romans as he writes Romans. He says, the mercies of God, that goodness of God, that grace that he gave you, and you understand that he took you from this slavery to sin, this spot of no hope, but yet gives you the ability this is it's kind of a therefore to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Because the grace of God, we can present ourselves as a living sacrifice because we're focused on things of the kingdom rather than the, the riches and, and, and pleasures of this here world. It was uh, this week, later this week, I'm uh, heading to Potosky on Saturday to do a wedding. And uh, there was a a pastor doing a wedding, he got to the point where he's doing the vows, and he asked a groom, do you take this woman to be your wedded wife? The pastor asked the nervous uh, bridegroom. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness or, and the bride interrupts, says, wait, 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 stop. Quit, you're going to talk him out of it. <laughs> we think about marriage, and there's a lot of jokes and lines about that. But God's love is intimate. Not only is God's love sacrificial towards us and our love should be, but his love is intimate. You think about marriage and intimacy of marriage. In Genesis, all the way back to Genesis, chapter 2 sets the framework for this. Chapter 2, verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The idea of separating from father and mother, starting a new family unit. Let's talk about the aspects of marriage that are important. There's a, there's a personal aspect. Obviously, marriage is personal between two people. There's a physical intimacy. That's a bond. It's a spiritual connection. It's an emotional connection. That's why the Bible over and over again talks about sexual uh, indiscretions. Don't do it. Save sex for marriage because there's a purpose behind that. Because physical um, intimacy has a bond, and it's meant to be shared with, within marriage. 
So you have this physical and spiritual connection, and there's, uh, there's also the, the sharing and supporting that you do for each other, uh, for married couples should be doing for each other on a constant basis. This is, happens during the good times and the bad times. There's the responsibility of building a family. Sometimes that involves kids often, but it just is a family unit. Whether it's the two of you or you add kids, you're, you're building a family unit. And most importantly, there's responsibility. I have responsibilities to Debbie. Debbie has responsibilities to me. And there's accountability. One of the great blessings of my life is to have Debbie to be accountable. She holds me accountable, and I hold her accountable. We hold each other accountable. We don't just wander around aimlessly. And within this framework, God has designed this beautiful system for us to thrive but it's, it's more than that because it's, it's not only personal, but there's a social aspect to it, meaning as we interact with society. I was telling Ron and Ruthie and explained earlier that it's a beautiful example. All of you guys that have had long runs in your marriage. It's a beautiful example for the younger generations to say, hey, this is, this is worth it because it's important. It's a building blocks of our society. Marriage is a status, so to speak. It's a, a place of responsibility to, uh, to society. We're to work within our family units to be productive and, and, and be whole and healthy and, and make our extended family the same way. There's a, there's a push and pull that goes on in there and it's important. We're, we're literally a working example of God's love. We see it. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was... Uh, a pastor in Germany during World War II and ended up towards just a, wasn't too many, a couple, a month or so before the war ended, and was executed for staying true to the Bible. But in one of his sermons, uh, he wrote this, uh, or preached this. He said he's talking about marriage and he mentioned that marriage is more than your love for each other, it has higher dignity and power, for it is God's holy ordinance. And I love that. It's God's holy ordinance. We, we talk about the, that, uh, you know, we have to go get a marriage license. God ordained this from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, that, we are, that marriage is a, a holy institution. It's not to be regulated by government. Well, we have to follow along. We, we understand that. But government doesn't get to redefine what marriage is. This is a holy ordinance. If God says it's this way, that's the way it is. It doesn't get to change. In your love, you see only the heaven of your happiness, but in marriage, you are placed at the post of responsibility towards the world and mankind. Your love is your own private possession, but marriage is something more than personal. It is an office that joins you together in the sight of God and man. Our marriages should be working examples of uh, Christ's love and God's love. Uh, just They can see it. And Ron and Ruth, you guys are a good example of that, right? That, that faithfulness, that working through hard times. It hasn't been easy for you the last few years, but yet you faithfully stay true to each other. That's an example to all of us of God's sacrificial love, of God's intimate love that he has for us. And I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. Also, it's a public witness. Think, look at, back at our story in verse 11. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. Then all the people. We see this, uh, I think this is uh, kind of an important thing. All the people were there to witness it. They're, they're excited about what's going on. We're to leave our father and mother and start this new, it's a public declaration. When I go to the wedding on Saturday, and I've been to other weddings, and you guys have all most likely been to a wedding in your lifetime. Everybody, friends and family, come to celebrate, right? It's a big deal. This is a public declaration, like baptism, is a public declaration of another family unit, and the friends and family come say, hey, we want this this new family unit to succeed. And we come and we support that. And that's important for... uh, for our society and for us today. See, love is relational. We crave, let's be honest, all of us crave deep, connected relationships in our lives. 
We do. We, connect, we want to have deep connections in our lives. And that's one of the things I think that's hurting our society today. We're on our phones. We're on the internet. We're on whatever. We're distracted, constantly distracted. And, and for many people across the nation, they don't have any deep, connected relationships. We're social. We're designed to be social. We're designed to be with each other. And that's important for us to understand. It's because God gives us that in our hearts to have a relationship with him. Marriage is a working example, symbol of God's relationship with us. In Ephesians, I'll be reading this passage to the groom uh, on Saturday, part of this passage anyways. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands, we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Christ loved the church. He was willing to give everything for the church. He, he willingly gave everything for the church, sacrificing his life and continues to minister to us as believers. That's the church. The church isn't this structure. It's you guys. It's us as a group of believers. That's the church, believers. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. We're to, husbands, we're to love our wives. We're to love our, lives way, love our wives the way Christ loved us. See, God's love is not from afar, but is one that's close and personal. As we talk about the, the, the relationship of marriage as an example of God's love, there's so many people that, that act like God's just far away and is not involved in their lives. But God is right there every step of the way for you. It's just too often we're trying to do it our own way instead of doing it God's way. We, we throw little pity parties for ourselves. We, we get ourselves in thinking the wrong thoughts. And we're not taking advantage of the love that God has right there for us. Why are you trying to do it on your own? See, when we give ourselves to God, that connection fills us. There's so many people in our society today that are just empty and they don't know what their purpose is and they don't know where they're going in life and they're trying to fill it with all kinds of crazy things. They might fill it with political desires, political causes. They might fill it with drugs or alcohol. They might fill it with all kinds of crazy relationships. They might fill it with who knows what, hobbies. But at the end of the day, it's empty because it's, it doesn't have purpose and it doesn't have the deep personal connection that God wants to have with them. I like to go fishing. How many of you guys are fisher, like to fish? Men and women like to fish? I really enjoy it. I've, I've been fortunate enough to do some on the ocean and some here in Michigan. And uh, there's nothing better, like, you know, you cast your bait out there and you're retrieving it, you're doing whatever, however you do it, and then you get that, that moment, right, where you, you land it, it's like, yeah, and you, the first thing you're out, I got one, I got one, or you got to tell everybody you got one, you start reeling, and then it's like, and, and you get that heavy pull on it, like, oh yeah, I got something big. Troy Lyons quarterback was fishing uh, a week ago down in Detroit, out on, I think, St. Clair, out on the river and uh, fishing with some buddies, and he had that same moment. Man, he, he landed something, and that pole's bent, and he's reeling it, and it's just pulling on him, and it's just, you almost feel the drag going out. He's adjusting his drag. He's pulling, he's pulling his buddy, gets the net out there, getting all fired up. You know, he's pulling this thing, and uh, he gets it up to the side, and they scoop it up, and it's a pair of old nasty boxer shorts that he snagged. <laughs> I'm just thinking that, Thank goodness he can get a body. He's down in Detroit. Who knows why you fish out of there? <laughs> but it felt right. It felt good. But that's that, that joy, that moment of joy was crashed there. Like, oh, I didn't get a fish. I got a bunch of seaweed. I got a big pair of boxer shorts. Nasty. I've seen a picture of them. They are nasty, too. They've been down there a while. But you talk about joy, right? There, there's something to catch in a big fish. There's, there's a joy to that. Just, uh, just a, you know, when we're doing something we enjoy, there's a joyfulness. God's love is joyful. We look in our, in, back into our story of Ruth and we, we see that Boaz does his master stroke, so to speak, as he works with this other 
redeemer and, and kind of positions this redeemer where he has to pass. And Boaz knows that, so Boaz can jump in the gap. And notice, like, in those romantic comedies, there's always that moment where the, the guy or the girl is going to save the day and is running to find the other one, right? They're getting on a train, they're getting on a plane, they're going to leave, and there's that moment where they go, and then they find each other, right? And you can almost imagine here at the gate, there's that moment, because all the people in verse 11, then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses, and then they give a, kind of a speech. We're like, yeah, we're witnesses. You can imagine they're almost like, hey, let's go find Ruth. Ruth's back home. She doesn't know what's going on. And they're going to go find Ruth. Maybe they all went together. Maybe Boaz is like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go tell Ruth. But anyways, you have kind of that moment, and that's kind of fun. There's just kind of a joyful element to it. So let's look at verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. The woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you in this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nurturer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the woman of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse the father of David. We see that God's love is a joyful love. It takes the pressures of this life off of our shoulders. We see the gift of love that God gives every day and just the graciousness of how he treats us, uh, and we're so grateful for that. But notice in our passage here, the Lord gave her conception. God is the originator of life. Life's blessings come from him. Think about Naomi's story, and I, I think this is wonderful. We see this, sur this story come to full circle. Naomi and her husband and her sons leave a terrible situation. There's famine in Bethlehem, and so they go to Moab, and they spend 10 years there, and there's famine in Moab, and they head back to Bethlehem. But, and when she came back, remember in, in verse 1, if you, or uh, in chapter 1, um, see, verse 20 and 21. She said to them when she came back, and they said, hey, is this Naomi? She said to them, do you not call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has, has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? You know, so we, we see chapter 4, 15, he shall... Be to you a restorer of life and a nurturer of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons as give birth to him. We see the whole circle for Naomi and Ruth. It was hard. It was brutal at times. They were eking out a barely eking out of existence. Who knew what the future was going to be, but yet their character, they stayed truthful and, 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 and true to God, faithful to God. And we see their gloom turn to joy. See, God's providence provided a way for these two godly women to go through hard times and end victoriously. All those around Ruth and Naomi experienced and saw the awesome power of God. Why were the people excited at the gate? They seen God working in a powerful way. And then when this child comes, imagine the fulfillment for Naomi. She's been faithful. She's trusted God. She hasn't understand. She couldn't understand it every moment. I can't imagine losing one of my sons. She lost both and her husband. She probably, at times, I wondered, how am I going to get through this? But she stayed true and she stayed faithful. And brought it, God brought it all the way around back in an awesome way. There's a great line in here. Let me highlight it. It says, blessed be the Lord who has not left us without a redeemer. Blessed be the Lord who has not left us without a redeemer. It's true. Blessed be the Lord who gave his son, Jesus, as our redeemer. Though we didn't deserve it, he gave it anyways. Boaz is kind of in this, in this story, is a, I think, a beautiful picture of Jesus. We see that Jesus talks to us as being the bride. The church is his bride. We see the self-sacrificing and 
that he loves us and wants a relationship with each one of us. I opened the service, was reading 1 Corinthians 13, and thought I'd end the sermon with the same passage because I think it drives home the point. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Let's take advantage of God's love in our lives. Let's put it, in, put it to use in practical ways. But it only changes our lives because we're active. It's not this crazy emotional journey, but that's okay. Emotions are fine. But this is one that is proactive. If you see the acts of love that Boaz did, and even Ruth to a certain extent, you see that they were actions more than they were emotions and feelings. Let's incorporate that into our daily walk with Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we humbly come before you and we're excited to, to see that you love us in an incredible way. That, you're, that you want a close, personal relationship with us, not one that we just look at you from afar and we call upon you when we're hurting or we call upon you when we're in trouble, but one that, that recognizes that you are with us and that you are loving us in a, in a way that we can't even measure or understand every day. Help us to understand that if we're going to imitate your love, that it's going to cost us stuff once in a while. It's going to cost us time, maybe resources on occasion. Maybe it'll cost us emotionally at times. But help us to show your love in a sacrificial way to those in our community. And help us just to really enjoy your love and enjoy life here. That you bless us in so many ways and we are to be joyful. Help us to be people of joy and help us take that joy to our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.